Hi there, this is Dr. John Burks. We're from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology at Franciscan University of Stewartville. And here we are on Friday of the octave of Easter. Every now and again, I like to remind us, what are we doing here? Well, we are here to praise and worship the Lord Jesus Christ, that he may be better known and loved, and many may come to have salvation through him. That's our life goal. That's why we're on the earth And these readings very much emphasize that. Today we're looking at Acts 4 in our first reading. And uh, Peter and John, of course, have cured that uh, man uh, handicapped from birth, as we saw on uh, previous days in the first reading. And do they get rewarded for that by the civil and religious authorities? No, as so often happens in life, no good deed goes unpunished. And so they are dragged before the Sanhedrin, which was kind of the civil slash religious court of the Jews that ran Jerusalem. And they're brought up on charges for what? For doing a good deed, for healing somebody. Boy, don't these guys have better things to do than hassle and harass those who are trying to do good deeds to others. I mean, don't they have some legitimate criminals that they could arrest and try? But we won't talk about that. Anyway, so here they are, and uh, Peter stands up and says, Leaders of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a cripple, namely by what means he was saved, then all of you and all the people of Israel should know that it was in the name of Jesus Christ The Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, in his name this man stands before you healed. And then he goes on to say, There is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. And that's a strong statement. That's, you know, salvation is only through Jesus. And many people are offended by that, especially in this current age where um, there is an attitude that uh, all religions are the same and there's no truth out there and uh, we're all just kind of uh, fumbling around trying to find our way to the divine and so on. But look, uh, this is not arrogance on the part of Jesus nor on the part of Jesus. The church to proclaim that Jesus is the only way of salvation and he is the only name by which we are to be saved. Because just look into it. The other great religious leaders of the world didn't even claim to be a savior. Muhammad didn't claim to be a savior figure. He claimed to be a prophet just to talk about the way to God, but not to be able to bring anyone to God personally. Buddha did not claim to be a savior either. Buddha just, again, uh, claimed to be a great teacher. He may not even have claimed to be great. He just offered a teaching to other people so that they could save themselves. In Buddhism, you save yourself. You don't look for salvation in somebody else. So we could go down the other uh, religions, etc. And we defined upon scrutiny that nobody else claims to be the savior of the human race. This is uh, unique to Jesus and to his apostles who affirm that he is the way, the truth, and the life to the Father. And that's another unique thing because the other leaders of world religions did not teach that God is a Father. And the goal of other world religions is not to be reconciled with a Heavenly Father. So, Jesus is the only one who offers this. Uh, He's the only uh, great uh, leader of a world religion who even claims this. And so there's no arrogance. It's not as if Jesus is saying, well, you know, Muhammad claims to be the Savior, but he's wrong and I'm right. No, Muhammad doesn't even claim to be the Savior of the human race. All right, so... So, Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There is no other name except his by which uh, we may be saved. There's no no, uh, even other rival claimants, okay? Joseph Smith didn't claim to be the savior of the world. There's no even 
other rival claimants for this role. So let's move now to uh, the gospel, John 21. Oh my goodness. Uh, We could spend a week talking about this passage too. This is just so incredible. This is our Lord's resurrection appearance to the seven apostles who are fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And there is so much going on here. First of all, I want to point out, in order to understand this post-resurrection appearance uh, of Jesus where the apostles fish all night, catch nothing, and then Jesus appears to them in the morning and says, throw your nets on the other side, and then they bring in this enormous catch of fish. This is a repeat of a a miracle and an encounter that Jesus had with basically the same crew of disciples at the beginning of their ministry, and it's recounted in Luke 5. And you have to know that episode from Luke in order to understand this episode from John, which is kind of interesting because John himself does not tell you about that earlier encounter. He kind of presumes you've either heard about it by word of mouth or maybe you've read Luke and so you know about it because that's part of the big point here. In Luke 5, Jesus performs that miraculous catch of fish and then calls these early disciples to him, to himself and uh, tells them, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And that was their, you know, kind of initial vocational call uh, when they began to follow Jesus. And now Jesus is repeating that again at the end of his earthly ministry with them. And the point is he's calling them back to their first love. He's calling them back to their original vocation to be fishers of men because they've kind of lost focus and gone back to being fishers of fish. But that's not what he wants them to be. And then uh, uh, after they cast it on the other side and they cannot pull it in, uh, Peter, always impetuous, that's his character and it comes through in all the Gospels, he jumps into the sea and uh, swims to be with Jesus And uh, the other disciples come in the boat, and they're trying to bring this uh, net with the fish, and uh, uh, they can't seem to bring it in. But we'll get back to that. First, though, it says, when they climbed out on shore, they saw a charcoal fish, excuse me, a charcoal fish, a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. This is very interesting. There's only one other charcoal fire in the Gospel of John, and it was a charcoal fire on the night of our Lord's betrayal, Peter was warming himself over that charcoal fire when he denied Jesus three times. And so I imagine when Peter gets out on shore and sees the charcoal fire, a little ding goes off in his brain. He's like, oh, the last time I saw a charcoal fire, I wasn't doing something very good. And maybe he anticipates how this encounter with Jesus is going to go. Well, we'll get back to that uh, later. That comes up in uh, a, a reading from a little bit further down in John 21. But for now, Jesus says, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore full of 153 large fish. Isn't that interesting? It sounds, the way it's described, it sounds like, oh, these All these uh, other disciples were little wimpy girly men, as we used to say when I was in high school, and couldn't bring that that net of fish onto the land. But Peter just rolls up his sleeves and goes and does it single-handedly. Like he's single-handedly stronger than the other six that are around, and he drags it ashore. But there's a theological significance to that. John is pointing to the importance of of Peter, the role of Peter, in evangelism. And this is true of Peter's successors as well, okay? We need the Pope for evangelistic effectiveness. Um, uh, So much depends on the successor of Peter in terms of the church's outreach. The rest of us cannot do it without uh, Peter. We need Peter's help to pull the net ashore because this has always been understood in in the church as representing the missionary outreach of the church here. And so let's always remember to pray for the Holy Father because we need him for the outreach, for the missionary work of the church. 
And even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. So Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them in like manner, the fish. This is a Eucharistic celebration. This is now the third time that Jesus was revealed to his disciples. So just like the Emmaus Road episode was a mass, this too is a mass where Jesus um, uh, multiplies the the fish and the loaves for the apostles, just like the feeding of the 5,000, uh, which was also in anticipation of the Eucharist. So they're sharing this meal with the resurrected Christ. And every time we go to Mass, we are sharing a meal with the resurrected uh, Jesus. And he gives us the power to do things that otherwise we could not do, one of which is evangelism. In our own power, we are just completely incompetent and we can fish all night and do nothing but when we have the command of the lord when we have the grace of the lord we can be amazingly effective not through our own power but through jesus's power but we also need the help of peter and peter's successor to bring it home so at this mass today let's pray for christ's grace to be effective in reaching our friends, family, and loved ones with the good news of Jesus Christ, the only one whose name brings salvation. Pray at Mass today that Jesus give you the words to share with your friends, family, and loved ones, and everyone uh, how they can be saved through Jesus Christ, who is the only path of salvation. And let's also pray for the Holy Father in a special way at today's Mass uh, that he would have the graces he needs from Christ to help us, to help the whole church to be evangelistically effective. This has been Dr. John Bergsman from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville wishing you a wonderful Easter octave.